Thanks for stimulating, uh, stimulating our, uh, our minds. So uh, just a question for Dr. Ludwig to start with that came from the audience. You did the entire dissection uh, and then went back and took the vessels. Why is that? I thought the hand assist approach was quick. I wouldn't think you'd be worried about ischemia. So, so why, why did you do it that way? It seems to me that that's uh, uh, a little cumbersome. Yeah, you can um, dissect them and take them you know, at the start if you want. Honestly, when I do rectal cancer surgery open, we always do take them early on during the case, and then we divide the bowel, uh, you know, divide the marginal, make sure it bleeds nicely from above, and then we divide the bowel, and then we pack it into the left upper quadrant, and then we go ahead and work distally. And one of the advantages of dividing everything early on during the operation is that if there is gonna be uh, ischemia, you will, by the end of the pelvic part of the surgery, you'll recognize it, because that bowel will be uh, ischemic. So if you divide the vessels at the end, um, th there is some risk of you know, making a pouch and then sticking it down there, and then at some point deciding that, gosh, that doesn't look very good. But I tell you what, we are just extraordinarily um, you know, um, uh, uh, obsessive about making sure that there's pulsatile flow along the marginal vessel. And so as long as you have pulsatile flow, you're fine. The real reason I do it is because if I'm going to have trouble, I just wanted to be right, right at the end because usually, you know, your, um, your hand port is right over that area anyway. So if there's a problem, you can quickly pop, you know, the uh, hand port out if you wanted to. And the IMA is usually going to be almost right underneath you. Um, so that's, I think the biggest reason I do it that way is because if I'm going to have trouble, I just want it sort of to be right at the end where everything is mobile. The last thing, when, when I'm going to have trouble, I like to make sure that I can take care of it easily. So um, if the bowel is all mobilized, you're divided distally, everything is ready to come out, and now my IMA is spurting, it's not a big deal. I can pop the gel port off. Um, I can pull the bowel out of the way and I'm looking right at the IMA and I can put a stitch onto it or whatever I want to do. So I think the biggest reason I do it is just because if there's trouble, I want to be able to deal with it easily. So that's why I do it that way. Fair enough. So uh, John, that, that endoanal uh, TEM approach that you showed, not, not as the hybrid, but just the straight endoanal TEM is the first video you showed where you did look like a, a circumferential dissection along with a lot of mesorectum. And you talked about doing that for T2N0 cancers, that is their stage by ultrasound or MRI is T2N0. So you finish the operation, patient does well, pathologist comes back, pathology report comes back rather, and you've got uh, four out of uh, eight lymph nodes positive. And now what do you do? Because it wasn't T2N0 after all, which we know well, is going to well, happen sure, in a sure. significant number of cases. The, uh, you know, this wasn't really a demonstration of our long time experience with full thickness local excision after chemo radiation but in that group of patients really what you're doing is using as a predictor if you would of microscopic nodal disease the response of the luminal cancer and so if you have an excellent response of something that was four centimeters and there's a small scar left you're making the assumption that you're going to have, you're going to clear microscopic disease from the lymph nodes, even though that's not necessarily so, for sure. That being said, all patients are discussed that this is, if you wish, a therapeutic excisional biopsy. And if there is full thickness penetration into the perirectal fat of tumor, or if there's nodal involvement, then we will go back and do a radical resection generally in six to eight weeks after that and do a total mesorectal excision and colorectal anastomosis. That being said, the number of patients that we've had to do that is something like 2%. So it's a very low incidence, but it's an excellent point and something that's always discussed with the patient preoperatively. So if I could just clarify, so because uh, it looked like on your data about 45% of your T2 patients were still T2 after the operation, if I read that correctly. So how do you judge response to chemo radiation? And if they don't respond, then do you therefore do a radical operation right up front? Is that correct? No, that's incorrect. I mean, what's difficult in terms of response, and this is really the bulkiness of the language 
that we used to stage rectal cancer in 2012 is that you could have a six centimeter cancer that fungates out into the lumen and that's on ultrasound confined to the muscularis propria and that's a T2. And then you could irradiate it, have a small scar and have two viable cancer cells in the muscularis propria and that's a YPT2. And so I, I think that um, if someone had no response to the radiation therapy, you likely would not offer them local excision. Okay, great. I'm going to now uh, pull the, uh, the panel here. So first of all, uh, who uses MRI for preoperative staging routinely for rectal cancer? Anybody in the panel? So instead of ultrasound or in addition? In addition. Sometimes both. But what do, you, what do you use first? What do you prefer first? Honestly, any um, anymore we really rely heavily on MRI. Sergio, I usually I usually use first uh, the ultrasound as as a guidance. And, and so then MRI for bulky tumors, bulky tumors, penetrating tumors, exactly. So the the purpose there is looking at the mesorectal envelope. Envelope, exactly. All right. Any difference, John? I would add that uh, oftentimes we get both of them. And, uh, and I would also add that we are also very uh, reliant on the bioprobe, on your physical examination in terms of looking at things. But clearly an, an MRI is probably the best uh, procedure. It depends where the patient's going to get the MRI in terms of the quality of that or the ultrasound. And that will impact whether or not we get both. Alessio? I agree with Serge. I think they both have uh, value. Uh if you want to decide versus, you know, between local excisions versus radical surgery, T1 or T2, then ultrasound is more me meaningful. If you want to look at the circumferential margin, uh, organ invasion and whatnot, MRI is more, I think, is more valuable. Okay, so to summarize, for an early cancer, EUS might be adequate, but for a more advanced cancer, MRI, can we all agree on that or not necessarily? Yes, yes. good, perfect, good. Okay, <laughs> and then uh, is radiation therapy, we'll start with Kirk again, is radiation therapy mandatory for all T3 rectal cancers? And specifically, does that include the upper rectum? And um, what about T3 N0 cancers of the mid rectum? Uh, well, almost all the guidelines you look at would say that yes, T3 node negative disease should be irradiated. In practice, this is what I do. So basically, if a tumor is anywhere in the midst of the upper rectal valve, which is usually at about 12 centimeters or so, I don't really feel compelled to radiate that patient unless some imaging study tells me that there might be a problem with a margin. So for true upper rectal cancers, I really don't use preoperative uh, radiation. And that kind of gets my uh, oncology colleagues and radiation people a little excited, but that's what I do. Um, for tumors in the uh, lower rectum, um, we're much more likely they're, they're going to irradiate a T3 node negative tumor. And, and the issue always is what about these tumors that sit somewhere a, around the middle rectal valve, which is usually just at the anterior peritoneal reflection. So tumors that are at or just slightly above the middle rectal valve, some I do and some I don't. Very it really good. just depends on what my estimation is as a likelihood that I'm going to have a margin problem. Okay. Sergio? In general, I think that we radiate everybody. Okay. With, John? with chemotherapy to combine. John? So uh, we will be, I would advocate irradiating patients with their cancer, the distal half of the rectum, as the local recurrence and failure rates are much higher in that group of people, and survival's uh, been shown to be worse, and only the unfavorable, which would be a more advanced T3 or node positive cancer in the upper rectum. Good. So when you say the middle half, are you talking about the middle valve of Houston, or what, what landmark do you use to define? The middle half of the rectum. Well, I, you know, I think that is a moving target. Uh, you know, there is no, it has to do with, I'm going to address a thin woman uh, with something that has a cancer just above the second valve differently than I would a 300 pound male pelvis. So I think um, it has to do really, I'm saying the same thing as uh, Kirk has said in terms of really what you're asking is to handicap the difficulty of the operation. The lower down you get, the higher your risk of failure. The more difficult the, op the patient presents to you, the higher your risk of failure, and they're going to be the people who get irradiated. Very good. Uh, Dr. Pagazzi. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, 
upper rectal cancer, uh, we're probably radiating uh, far more than, than we should, especially the, the T3s. Uh, also important, the, of important thing is the location of the tumor, posterior tumor. We feel much more comfortable not radiating versus anterior ones. Um, so I think in our practice, anything that we can get in the upper rectum, T3, that we can get four or five centimeter margin, I will consider that and treat it more like a colon cancer rather than rectal and just do uh, primary surgery. Okay, we've got a couple of good questions from the audience now. In fact, one of them parallels the question I had written down here. So uh, somebody noticed, Dr. Pagazzi, that there was a high number of protective ileostomies in the robotic group compared to your laparoscopic group in your comparative trial. Is that the new standard or is that part of the learning curve in the first cases or does that reflect the uh, patient mix? And then the other panel after you finish, talk to me about when do you divert? But let's, let's so, yeah, in that, in that study, uh, I said there was a bias in favor of the laparoscopic uh, group because those were higher tumors. So higher tumor usually would tend not to divert as much as very low resections uh, who have been radiated. Those, we still divert the majority of them. Not all, but the vast majority of them get diverted, unfortunately. Uh, we electively divert all of our patients who've had preoperative chemo radiation. I divert all the patients when the anastomosis will be at the level of the elevators or below. Yeah, I, I with very few exceptions, divert um, all my coloanals. The risk of a leak and the consequences of a leak are just um, more than you really want to put up with. So I, essentially, almost everyone that gets a coloanal is going to get a loop ileostomy. And what about the use of a reservoir, i.e. a colonic J pouch or coloplasty, routine? At what level? Yeah, well, after a total mesorectal excision, you know, you, 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 you find yourself at the top of the anal canal within a couple of centimeters of the dentate line. So any anastomosis at that level, I'll reconstruct them with a colonic J pouch. I have to say it's been a long time since I've done a, uh, a coloplasty, I was honestly never all that excited about them, and I, I remain that way. So um, I, I make a J pouch for almost everyone. Sergio? I uh, occasionally use a colonic pouch uh, only on the, let's say, thin patient that has a very pliable descending colon that would allow you to, you know, turn it around and staple it together. And if it's a pelvis that I will accommodate also that fold up uh, bowel, I think that sometimes you create more trouble by trying to create that little pouch and trying to get an anastomose. Uh, at the end result, after a year, patients do pretty much the same, being a straight anastomosis or with the pouch. John? Uh, I would say that I, just for, for clarity, I fall probably somewhere in between. I think... Uh, I've noticed over, having been a proponent just of doing straight colanals, um, more and more now we do clonic uh, J pouches. I think, particularly in the beginning, those people do have kind of better than quote expected outcomes. And but if you don't have length, I'd rather do a straight colanal than put things at risk for a small pouch. And a lot of times now we're doing a, uh, an endocide anastomosis as well. You want to divert? Yes. When you're yeah. doing the Bless you. Yeah, I agree. If the pelvis is wide and you have plenty of colon, uh, do it. If not, I wouldn't uh, cut corners just to try to do a J-pouch. Any other questions for the audience, please uh, either text them or, or stand up. Uh, but I have one last question. So, uh, Dr. Ludwig, we'll start with you again, because I think your video showed that you transect right at the descending sigmoid junction. At least that's the impression you gave. Do you always do that, or do you ever say the sigmoid, can the sigmoid ever be used as a reservoir or part of your reservoir or your anastomosis? Well, for two reasons, I don't like to use a sigmoid. Number one, I assume that it's in most of these patients are, let's just say, are, are going to have, have been irradiated. So I kind of assume that the uh, distal and the mid sigmoid have likely been in the radiation field. And for that purpose, I would not want to make my reservoir out of that piece of bowel. And the second reason is that that right sigmoid in. is so thick and nasty that I'd like to just get rid of it. So I usually would like to use the, uh, the descending colon. Any difference of opinion, Sergio or John or Alessio? No, I think it's very important to use the descending colon for the anastomosis. I think you should use healthy colon. 
I don't think we should be too dogmatic about it. You know, if there is obviously diverticulitis, as it's often the case in U.S. patients, obviously you shouldn't use it. But if the colon is healthy and there is a, a, a reasonable chance that it doesn't be radiated because it was outside the pelvis, then I think you can use whatever, whatever is there. Well, great. I want to thank uh, the panel and ask Dr. Peter Marcello to come up. He's going to now take over and uh, moderate the final <coughs> third of the morning session. Thank you again.